first and foremost, before I start this episode, I want to give a huge thanks and a shout out to David Politis, who is a giant contributor and author. There's a movie out there um, that you can watch that's all about the missing 411 cases. I'm sure a lot of you have watched it or know about it. Uh, David Pilates has put a lot of time, effort, and money into these missing cases that are all over the United States in and within these national forests. So I need to make sure that I give credit where credit's due. Links in the description below for you to check out some of those if you haven't yet. And now let's get into these stories. In the southern regions of Vermont, short distance from the small town of Bennington, as a vast green expanse known as the Green Mountain National Forest. Blanketing gently rolling hills of the Glastonbury Mountains, its dense woodlands are made up of sugar maple, beech, and yellow birch. The forest also supports a diverse ecosystem. Beaver, moose, and white-tailed deer are known to roam the landscape, preyed upon by numerous black bears and coyote packs. Several areas of the forest have been designated as national wilderness areas and are managed by the United States Forest Service as part of their wilderness preservation scheme. This means such areas are completely off limits to all motorized and mechanical vehicles, including mountain bikes. The name Green Mountain Forest might ring a bell among poetry enthusiasts, as one of its trails bears the name of the award-winning Robert Frost. But to others, the forest has a decidedly different reputation, and to this day, some locals still warn against entering those woods alone. Prior to the Revolutionary War, the area surrounding the Glastonbury Mountains remained mostly unsettled. But as the colonies expanded, so did the demand for building materials. To supply that demand, New Hampshire's governor decided to found a lumber camp in the very heart of the Green Mountains, and did so in the year 1761. At first, just six families moved into the camp, but in the years that followed, dozens more arrived seeking employment, and by 1870, the camp was home to 300 lumberjacks and their families. By that time, many believed they were no longer living in a lumber camp, but a full-fledged township. The site had already been chartered, so all they needed was a name. They chose Glastonbury. Glastonbury's lumber industry thrived for generations. Yet these days, only eight residents reside in what is now a ghost town. The exact reason behind its decline is hotly disputed. Some claim that due to the gigantic regional demand, the area was hideously overlogged, and the residents simply moved on once the work dried up. This is a reasonable assumption, since laborers made up a huge portion of the workplace at the time. Yet such people often settled in a place once they earned a little money, setting up farms and stables on the deforested land. So why did a few of them stick around? Others have argued that an inability to defend themselves from Native American war parties led the lumberjacks to seek prosperity elsewhere. Once again, this is another very reasonable assumption, as raiding parties would have no doubt taken advantage of the dense woodland to launch devastating ambushes against Glastonbury and its citizens. However, one group of amateur sleuths has a much more menacing theory regarding Glastonbury, something that involves what they refer to as the Bennington Triangle. Rumor has it that long before the arrival of English settlers, the local Abenaki tribe used the Green Mountains as a burial ground for their dead, believing that venturing too far into the haunted forest amounted to a death sentence. The natives stayed well away from it when not performing their intricate burial ceremonies. But the same could not be said for the British lumber barons, who instead of seeing a sacred cemetery, saw nothing but an opportunity to enrich themselves even further. One example of the Abernaki folklore surrounding the region tells of a rock which devours those who walk by it. Obviously, this is a physiological impossibility, and the tale was treated as nothing but a ghost story by early English settlers. Yet some complain of eerie silences or unexplained disappearances while out hunting near the supposedly cursed rock, leading many a former skeptic to question the tale's legitimacy. Years later, there was discovered to be an element of truth to that story when geologists found an unusually large number of sinkholes around that rock, believed to have been caused by subterranean water erosion. And the sudden opening of a sinkhole might well account for one or two townsfolk inexplicably vanishing. But even so, 
Not all the mysterious disappearances can be explained away by mere sinkholes, leading us to believe that something else is going on in that vast and ancient forest. In 1943, a man named Carl Herrick took his cousin Henry on a hunting trip around 10 miles northeast of Glastonbury. The story goes that, at some point, Carl walked off into the woods to take a leak and was never seen again. Henry walked in the woods for a while, calling out his name. He was nowhere to be found. Over the days that followed, a volunteer search party scoured the woods for any sign of him, and eventually, they stumbled across a set of human remains. Many believed the corpse had once been Carl, yet it proved to be extremely difficult to identify. And this is down to how violently and catastrophically the corpse had been crushed. The damage was so extensive that one of Carl's ribs had punctured his lungs. Yet bizarrely, there was nothing in the immediate vicinity of his body that could have caused such a horrifying death. Henry later reported that what appeared to be a large bear track could be seen around the corpse. Yet a bear would never kill by crushing or constriction, nor would it allow fresh meat to spoil in a way that Carl's corpse had. If a bear was indeed to blame for Carl's death, something must have severely spooked it. Just two years later in 1945, the Mitty Rivers incident occurred. Rivers was an experienced outdoorsman, and very few people knew the forest around Green Mountain better than he did. But one day, Rivers was heading up a hunting party in a place known as Hell's Hollow, when he happened to stray a little too far ahead. Soon it dawned on his fellow hunters that Mitty was no longer with them, but none of the hunters showed any initial concern. After all, Rivers was probably the most skilled hunter and tracker that any of them had ever known. It had to be just a matter of time before he found them again, yet no one ever saw or heard from him ever again. After a long, intensive search of the surrounding woods, the only trace of Mitty Rivers was an empty rifle cartridge that matched up with the kind he was known to use. There's no blood or shredded clothing left behind, no evidence of an animal attack whatsoever, and his corpse was never found. But perhaps the most well-known of all the Bennington Triangle disappearances is the case of Paula Weldon. She was a sophomore student at the nearby Bennington University, and on the 1st of December 1946, 18-year-old Paula headed out into the woods on a short hike, intended to relieve some stress from her studies. Paula was wearing a light red jacket, not ideal for a lengthy hike in the cold weather, so it's safe to say that she had not intended to be out for a particularly long time. She was last sighted by a couple out for a walk on a stretch of land known as Long Trail. They witnessed Paula turn a corner, but when they reached that same spot, she had inexplicably vanished from sight. And it would be very hard to miss such a bright red jacket among the dark foliage. The following day when her classmates noticed her unusual absence, they immediately informed the local police, who commenced a very thorough search of that Long Trail. The search party was a thousand strong at times, it even included a number of light aircraft enlisted by the FBI, but still, not a trace of Paula was ever found. Paula was by far the most famous case, but the most tragic was that of eight-year-old Paul Jefferson. Paul's mother was employed by the local garbage dump, and on the 12th of October 1950, Paul accompanied his mother to work since he was off school for the holiday. They didn't intend to stay long at all. So Paul's mother told him to stay put in the truck while she popped into the office to complete a few pieces of paperwork. When she got back to the truck, Paul was gone. Much like Paula Weldon, Paul was wearing a brightly colored rain jacket that would be almost impossible to miss on the backdrop of the surrounding woods. But when another huge search was mounted, which this time included sniffer dogs from the local police force, still nothing was found. It was as if Paul had vanished into thin air. But analysis of local Abenaki folklore found a disturbing tidbit of information regarding the wearing of bright colors in the forest. Apparently, it's extremely bad luck to wear anything but dark shades while visiting Native American burial grounds, as it offends the spirits of the dead, a truly terrifying detail to consider. In the same month, October of 1950, a young woman named Frida Langer and her family were on a camping trip near the Somerset Reservoir deep within the Bennington Triangle. Frida and her cousin Herbert set off on a hike around the area. But less than a mile into the little adventure, Frida took a tumble and landed in a stream. But given they weren't all that far from their campsite, 
free to turn back to get a change of clothes, while Herbert waited at the site of her accident for her to return. After an hour or so of waiting, Herbert walked back to the camp, outraged that his cousin would leave him waiting for so long. But when he asked after her, he discovered that she had never made it back to camp. Her disappearance was completely unexplainable, and many puzzled over how a girl could possibly vanish over the course of such a short journey. By this time, the number of inexplicable vanishings meant that the woods had garnered quite the reputation as being mysteriously but undeniably dangerous. It also seems like the power of Bennington Triangle is not just confined to the woods. James Tedford, a veteran of World War II, was returning to his residence at a VA hospital in Bennington during 1949 after a visit to some of his family in the nearby St. Albans. His journey was via Greyhound bus that held no more than 14 other passengers. But somehow, when the bus arrived in Bennington, Tedford wasn't on board. Yet strangely, not only was his luggage still in the bus's rack, but the personal items belonging to Tedford, including a jacket and his ticket, were sitting on his seat in his place. The other passengers were later questioned by the police when he was reported missing, but not a single one reported seeing him disembark at any point in the journey. In fact, they'd seen him sitting in his seat at every single scheduled stop, just not the one he was due to get off at, Bennington. Since Tedford's disappearance was yet another in a series of mysterious vanishings in the Bennington area, police were eager to get the bottom of this case as quickly as they possibly could. But logically speaking, they could only settle on one solid conclusion, that Tedford never boarded the bus in the first place. But this stood in stark contrast to the fact that not only was his luggage on board, but he'd been sighted by many of his fellow passengers. Like many of the other disappearances in the Bennington Triangle, Tedford's case remains totally unsolved to this day. But there must be a practical, tangible explanation for such disappearances, even if they do seem fairly outlandish. One theory centers around intense, unpredictable weather patterns that New England areas suffer from. Professional hikers and mountaineers alike insist that the disappearances are down to nothing more than poor weather, since wind patterns in the area can be incredibly erratic. Even those familiar with the case could lose their footing in perilous situations, or suffer from serious disorientation in some cases. However, although this might account for one or two of the missing persons, it certainly does not account for all of them. Many visitors to the area have also reported seeing cougars in the Green Mountain National Forest. These big cats can stalk hikers for long distances, while waiting for an opportune moment to strike. Lone hikers are by far at the most risk especially during the winter when the mountain lion's natural prey is very scarce, which also happens to be when the majority of the disappearances have occurred. They can weigh more than 200 pounds. A powerful cougar can subdue and kill someone very quickly, but a mountain lion would most certainly leave behind traces of their kill, be it bones or shredded clothing, and in most of the Bennington disappearances, not a single piece of evidence of the unfortunate souls has ever been found. However, another theory one rooted in mental illness, is much more feasible. One story tells a bizarre character by the name of McDowell, moving to Bennington in 1892, looking for work at a local sawmill. The man was a solitary, quiet soul, brimming with malcontent, and was viewed with suspicion and fear by other workers. Then, a few months after floating from job to job, he got into an argument with the foreman, and smashed the man over the head with a hammer before slaying another one that came into the foreman's defense. The man was ranting and raving as local lawmen cornered him into one of the town's taverns, and once he was in custody, he was confined to an insane asylum for the foreseeable future. But the man was wild, violent, and cunning, and it didn't take him long to escape the asylum and into the mountains to hide among their many caves and caverns. Some say the horrendous environment of the asylum, the callous abuse of the orderlies and doctors, had turned him well and truly feral, and every so often, the man would descend from the mountains to terrorize the residents of the town, wearing only a long black coat with a pistol in his hand. McDowell may have been able to prey upon the town's residents during the early 1900s, but by the middle of the century, he would have been a much older man, meaning it's unlikely he survived in the wilderness for such a considerable length of time. Perhaps it'll never be entirely certain what is to blame for the bizarre disappearances in the Bennington Triangle, be it the weather, wild animals, or a deranged serial killer. 
The area itself is without a doubt one of the most inexplicably dangerous places in the entirety of the United States for those who are unlucky enough to find themselves alone among the trees. It's truly chilling to think that these disappearances might never be solved. The fates of those poor souls might be forever kept a secret, hidden among the mountains of forest of the Green Mountain National Forest. In the early spring of 1978, Stephen Kubaki was 23 years old and a history major at Hope College, located in the small town of Holland, Michigan. Those who knew him viewed Stephen as a highly intelligent but deeply eccentric young man who once designed an intricate electronic security system to prevent theft from the university's library. He was also a huge Dungeons and Dragons nerd, but unlike some of the quieter companions, Stephen was a highly athletic and outgoing. He enjoyed mountain climbing, long distance running, and most of all, cross-country skiing. One of his favorite spots was up in Oceana County, in the shores of Lake Michigan. He'd ski up there on a handful of previous occasions, and knew the area relatively well. But after a solo skiing trip in February of 1978, Stephen failed to return home. On the Monday he was due back, on the Monday he was due back, some of his fellow students noted his absence with concern. But if he had indeed spent the past 72 hours traipsing around the frozen wastes of central Michigan, there's a good chance that he needed a recovery day. Yet when Tuesday rolled around and Stephen was still nowhere to be seen, his friends began to realize that something was wrong. It was extremely out of character for Stephen to miss one day of classes, let alone two. So after numerous calls to his apartment went unanswered, a missing persons report was filed with local law enforcement. While members of Michigan State Police were gearing up for what promised to be a long and arduous search, a pair of snowmobilers went up near Sagatuck to make a chilling discovery. Lying in the snow-covered field, completely abandoned, was Stephen's backpack. After a search of the surrounding area turned up to no signs of their missing person, the search teams began moving north to a place they believe Stephen's journey might have started. There they found a trail of frozen footprints in the snow prints that were made by the same size boot as Stephen would have been wearing. The discovery caused a great deal of excitement among the search and rescue personnel who believed that Stephen's discovery was imminent. Following the trail, they discovered something as horrifying as it was mysterious. The footprints led all the way to the shores of the semi-frozen Lake Michigan, and it was here that Stephen's trail suddenly vanished. The direction in which they were headed led many to surmise that, for some reason, Stephen had walked out into the ice, and if he'd been unlucky enough to have it crack and shatter beneath him, there was only a minuscule chance that he was still alive. The search and rescue teams were baffled as to why an experienced outdoorsman would do something so dangerous, but many concluded that he was most likely being pursued. It made sense that Stephen had jettisoned his heavy backpack in order to gain some speed, and perhaps he'd run out into the ice in belief that whoever, or whatever, following him would be deterred. Without any trace of him, or any other of his belongings, there were no concrete conclusions to be drawn, and Stephen's case grew as cold as the ice of Lake Michigan. As weeks turned into months, and Stephen remained missing, hope began to dwindle. The college awarded Stephen his bachelor's degree in absence, something they only did for students who had suddenly and tragically passed away. What's more, the Holland Police Department actually had Stephen's dental records sent over to their counterparts in Chicago. In an attempt to eliminate the possibility, it had fallen victim to the notorious serial killer, John Wayne Gacy. His ultimate fate remained uncertain, but the vast majority agreed that Stephen was no longer with us. Yet in reality, he was very much alive. Sometime later, Stephen awoke in the darkness and found himself laying on a patch of grass in a place he wasn't familiar with. It took him a minute or two to regain his senses. They quickly realized he was not only in an unfamiliar place, he was wearing unfamiliar clothes. He remembered the skiing trip, but none of his equipment was anywhere to be found. And what's more, it was warm outside. Stephen's last memories were gliding through the snow drifts of central Michigan. And suddenly, it was warm enough to sleep outside wearing little more than a t-shirt. A deep breath kept panic at bay, and after gathering up what were apparently his belongings, Stephen approached a passing stranger to ask where they were. Pittsfield, 
came a reply from the visibly puzzled stranger. Stephen believed the stranger was referring to the suburb of the South Ann Arbor, which was known for its golf course and municipal airport, but he was still perplexed as to how he'd gotten there in the first place. When asked if everything was okay, Stephen reassured the concerned stranger, voiced his confusion at his sudden appearance on the opposite side of Michigan's peninsula. His response caused the stranger to become even more perplexed. Stephen wasn't in Pittsfield, Michigan. He was in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. It's difficult to imagine the kind of fright that Stephen experienced in those moments, realizing he traveled hundreds of miles without a single memory of it. But the real terror didn't set in until he saw a copy of the local newspaper. It wasn't the headlines that caught Stephen's eye. It was the date. He'd started his journey back in February of 1978, but the date on the newspaper read May 5th of 1979. After suffering through a period of complete and utter shock, he managed to compose himself, begin brainstorming solutions. You remember that he had an aunt in Great Barrington, a small town just a few miles from where he'd found himself. And after hitchhiking out to her place, he walked up the driveway and knocked on the door. It was like seeing a ghost, she later said. We all thought he was gone, so to suddenly just see him one day right there on my doorstep it was a very emotional occasion. The news of Stephen's return captured the attention of news agencies around the globe, who dispatched correspondents to uncover the truth behind his mysterious reappearance. Meanwhile, the Holland Police Department helped Stephen organize a press conference, and he used the opportunity to answer many of the public's burning questions. But unfortunately, many of his responses raised more questions than they answered. For example, when he asked about the belongings he had with him when he woke up, Stephen talked about the contents of his backpack, a backpack he had no memory of acquiring. It was filled with all the accoutrements of travel and survival, suggesting that he traveled extensively over the previous 15 months. He was in possession of souvenirs from Chicago, Nevada, Northern California, meaning that journey would have spanned the entire continental US. Stephen also mentioned that he felt as if he'd done a lot of running, something which was corroborated by a t-shirt found in his possession. The t-shirt was a piece of memorabilia from a marathon that had taken place in Wisconsin. And we've already established that Stephen was a passionate distance runner, but is it possible that he took part in such a grueling event and walked away with no memory of it whatsoever? When questioned on the last thing that he remembered before waking up in Massachusetts, Stephen mentioned feeling cold and scared. He believed that he blacked out due to exhaustion and exposure, but had no idea why his footprints led out into the ice of Lake Michigan. Although he couldn't rule it out, he had no memory of being pursued by anyone, but agreed that there was only a minuscule chance that he could have fallen through the ice and lived to tell the tale. Stephen also shared the result of the medical exam he'd underwent following his return, and reassured journalists that he was perfectly healthy, albeit completely exhausted. It was then that journalist asked Stephen if he planned on talking to any kind of psychologist or therapist, in hopes they might be able to recover his lost memories. Bizarrely, Stephen said no. I don't think mental health had anything to do with it, he told reporters. I had a job lined up. There was no trouble with girls. My dad was about to sign over the house to me. I was in a good place mentally. It's easy to understand why Stephen would dismiss the idea of a depressive psychotic break being the cause of his disappearance. But if you lost 15 months of your life and quite possibly ran thousands of miles in the process, wouldn't you want to explore therapeutic options to recover those memories? As of March 2023, Stephen is alive and well and is running a tech consultation startup based in New York City. For decades now, he has refused to discuss his disappearance, despite several lucrative offers from journalists desperate for an interview. Reporters have even reached out to his ex-wife in an effort to secure an interview with her. But much like Stephen, no amount of money seems to loosen her lips. Contemporary media outlets seem more than happy to let the incident remain a mystery, knowing all too well that any attempt to reach out to Stephen will be rebuffed. And in the absence of any solid theories regarding his disappearance, chilling rumors have circulated instead. A common theory among those more metaphysically minded involves the so-called Lake Michigan Triangle. The triangle spans from Manitowoc, Wisconsin to Ludington in Michigan, and then to South Benton Harbor. And since Stephen's disappearance occurred around its eastern boundary, some have said that he was a victim of its eerie phenomena. Since the turn of the 20th century, several other mysterious disappearances have occurred in this region, 
along with the unexplained shipwrecks, plane crashes, and UFO sightings that date back centuries. One particularly terrifying tale involves the crew of a small sailing vessel, out sailing on Lake Michigan during a serene summer's evening. Out of nowhere, they became engulfed in a sudden vortex, with winds coming in from opposite directions. The ship was turned this way and that, and would have surely capsized if the freak winds hadn't suddenly abated. UFO chasers believe the alien visitation is to blame for some of the incidents, and some have suggested that Stephen has no memory of his absence because he was abducted. In more practical terms, a freak storm might have caused Stephen to slip and fall, causing a head injury so severe it caused a psychotic break. But if that was the case, why did his medical exam find him to be in near perfect health? Time after time, attempts to logically explain Stephen's disappearance fell flat in the face of mind-bending anomalies, to the point where even the skeptical mind begins to wonder if something inexplicable is afoot. In recent years, it emerged that Stephen once attempted to retrace his steps near Lake Michigan, hoping it might jog his memories of the day he went missing. If he remembered something, he certainly didn't share it in print, even though doing so would have made him a very wealthy man. And that raises two very important questions. Has Stephen remained silent regarding his disappearance because it's still a mystery to him? Or has he since remembered something so shameful or terrible that he can't possibly bring himself to talk about it? Such talk will never amount to more than speculation. And considering there are many similar cases, it's very possible that he suffered a highly terrifying but natural phenomenon. Yet such mysteries will always plant seeds in fertile imaginations. And for some of us, it's difficult not to wonder if something much more sinister is lurking beneath the waves of the Lake Michigan Triangle. Hey everyone, thanks for listening if you stuck around at this point. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out. If you have a true scary story of your own, feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit. You can stalk me on Twitter, you can stalk me on Facebook, and you can also stalk me on Instagram. All these links are below. Howdy, y'all. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this episode. I really, really, really love Missing 411 stories and cases, and I've been completely enthralled and obsessed with it for years now. Ever since I heard about it through Mr. Ballin and then watching the documentary on YouTube as well as other content creators doing uh, episodes on it, I've done kind of yes and no in the past, but nothing like completely devoted to just strictly missing 411 cases. So I'm hoping you at least heard uh, a few stories that you hadn't heard about yet. I know the, uh, the second one, I believe Mr. Ballin did as well, but you know, again, you're going to hear duplicate stories. I'm not going to go on another tangent about it, but more than likely the next episode will be either paranormal or gas station stories. Uh, there's been a lot of people wanting paranormal stories uh, within the comment section that I've seen and I don't ever do them. So I'm going to do one hopefully soon. The problem is with this within the Reddit community that still is doing the blackout. So like r slash paranormal and ghost stories and stuff like that it's still um, i don't know we'll see what happens i don't know if it's been lifted yet i haven't checked today but as of yesterday it still was so we'll see what happens um yeah i don't think i got anything else so that episode will probably be out saturday sunday or monday so i'll be on the lookout for that one i uh, got some other shit going on the rest of this week so i may get to it i may not so just be on the lookout for that around one of those days and I will see you guys then. Cheers.